Okay, so thanks, Nula. Um, I suppose one of the things that Louise and Colin mentioned earlier on was the, um, the, the type of land that you're talking about, okay? So they were talking about higher elevation, peat lands, uh, and I suppose the other thing is, of course, that um, it's pine. And on the left-hand side, you might have what we would traditionally associate with forestry at one stage. But since the early 90s, uh, we've forestry has moved back down into more uh, fertile land, possibly more mineral soils, uh, particularly due with the onset of private afforestation. Okay, uh, now there isn't any reason to be complacent simply because it is different ground. Uh, despite its name, of course, a uh, pine weevil, uh, it's an insect that affects a lot of different species, uh, and I suppose the next question is. Private forestry, uh, potentially, why is it vulnerable? I think one of the main reasons are the forest age class and also the forest species composition. So looking at the forest age class here, just to give you an idea, under, just under three quarters of the national forestry estate is under 30 years of age. So it's a very young forestry estate, okay? 80% of the conifers are under 30 years of age and maybe 60% plus of the broad leaves. And then when you look at this between private and state forestry, it becomes more stark, okay? 98% of all private grant-aided forestry is under 30 years, okay? So there is going to be a lot of forestry at that age that will be coming up for thinning, that will be coming up for felling, either clear fell or continuous cover forestry, okay? So it's all coming at the same time. The other issue then is, of course, the species composition. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of this, but you're looking at about 71% conifers and 29% broadleaves, okay? Uh, what I draw your attention to is, again, even though it's called pine weevil, uh, and pines make up 11% of the species composition, uh, sp spruces are also vulnerable. 52% Sitka spruce, 4% Norway spruce, uh, and so on. Douglas fir, again, is also vulnerable to it, okay? And some of the broad leaves are as well. So there are ongoing efforts by forest owners and the state to increase what you could call the palette of tree species. But the fact remains that conifers, and in particular spruces, will remain one of the mainstays of both our harvesting industry and also the construction timber industry, okay? That is just going to be a fact. Just to emphasize this, it, this is from the All Iron Brownwood production forecast uh, out to 2040, and it gives the net realizable timber production. So it's estimating how much volume should become available in the next 20 years. And what you're looking with private forestry is you're looking at an increase from 1.74 million cubic meters in 2022, and it'll go up to 3.5 within the next 10 years. In fact, by 2025, private forestry should be exceeding quilters production, okay? So that is a considerable amount of timber coming out. Up to 2040, 88% of that volume will come from Sitka spruce and Norway spruce. 4% will come from lodgepole pine. Other conifers will make up 6%, and then broadleaves will be 3%. So what it's saying is that more and more of this private timber will come to clear fell as opposed to sites that are currently being tinned. The greater number of stumps, greater number of opportunities for the pine weevil to breed, okay? And then in conjunction with this felling, either through clear fell or continuous cover forestry, there will also be a greater requirement for replanting and encouraging natural regeneration. And all of these then are vulnerable to this pine weevil, okay? I've mentioned private forestry before, um, private forest owners, so who exactly are they, okay? So these are the private forestry, about 51% is public, the remainder is private. Uh, some of it's grant aided, some of it is not. Probably 35% is grant aided. This is this cohort there that I was supposed uh, Chagas would particularly interact with. So who are they? 85% uh, of them, farming is their main enterprise. 78% uh, of them are grant aided, 
They also tend to be older, they're 50 years and plus. They're also new to forestry, okay? Uh, they don't have a large amount of management experience. They're first generation forest owners. And this is something that's very important, okay? Obviously enough, we're aware of the risk, or most of it should be, certainly within the last two hours. Uh, but it'd be unwise to assume that private forest owners have a large knowledge or awareness of this, okay? And this awareness is essential. It's essential for the forest owners and it's essential for the woodland managers uh, to do the appropriate, timely action to take into reducing damage levels to acceptable levels. And this is the other thing. It's reducing damage to acceptable levels. It's not the elimination of damage. That's an impossibility, both on an economic level and, you know, uh, e even on an environmental cost benefit as well. It simply won't happen. Okay, but building awareness can happen. One of the benefits of this and one of the methods of doing it is these knowledge transfer groups. Many of you are aware of those. So these knowledge transfer, transfer groups are funded by the Department of Agriculture. Uh, they're run by forestry companies, forest owner groups, and then there's a lot of input from Chagas as well in them. And the idea is to build up this capacity in these first generation forest owners. Uh, expose them to concepts, concerns and challenges that they mightn't even be aware of. The benefit of these, I'll give from an example, a recent example, where there was a eight, an eight hectare conifer plantation uh, that was the first thinning carried out. At the same time, uh, the owner also noticed that his ash was actually dying, so there was ash dieback disease. He resulted in and having to clear fell the ash. Uh, he clear felled it and then replaced it with a crop of Sitka spruce and alder, which he planted in inverted mounds in March 2022. Okay, uh, and that's just a recent picture. F the fortunate thing about this is at the centre of all this decision making was the forest owner himself. Uh, this is Brendan Keane from Dunhill and County Waterford. Uh, the other unfortunate thing is that he had participated in a, one of these knowledge transfer groups in 2019. So he was fully aware of the risk of pine weasel on the new planting that might occur, even from thinning. It might not necessarily clear fell, but even from the thinning in operation itself, there could be a large increase in the potential breeding material. Okay. So provision was made for using larger pre-dipped plants, and then he hot planted them as well. Okay, so they were, they were, the site was planted almost immediately between the thinning of his conifers and the clear felling of the ash. He then commenced uh, doing uh, stump packing uh, to monitor the weevil feeding uh, periods and as a method of uh, predicting an outbreak. He's also aware that these, if he's applying insecticide, if it is necessary, or it does turn out to be necessary later on this year, that it is time critical, that he has a window of about six weeks in order to make it work. What Brendan would say is that he's not adverse to, uh, he's not adverse to using other um, alternative control methods, but they need to be proven. He's not willing to risk his time and his money on something that he can't be sure that he's going to get a result out of. So, I'd like to say that the engagement like this is widespread amongst forest owners. Uh, I generally blush when I make an exaggeration, so I'd be blushing now, okay? It's not. Many forest owners, like I said, first generation forest owners, they're not aware of the risk. Now, fortunately, professional foresters are. Uh, much of the audience here, I would guess. And they budget for the potential of weaver control in reforestation sites. This is an example. Uh, I'm sure some people in the audience are, might be willing to quibble the, the different prices, uh, but they're indicative figures. And I'd just like to thank some of my forestry colleagues that fed into the, the results of this, uh, coming up with some of the prices. What we are seeing is that the cost of reforestation is going up. Previously, we would have said it might have been two and a half to 3,200 euros per hectare to re-establish the site. It is considerably more now. You're probably looking at somewhere between 3,700 and 4,000 per hectare. When you take in that you're going to have to do this control possibly for up to three years. So, you know, 
you're talking about dipping the plants you're talking about spraying the weevil it may be twice in one year so you could be looking at a situation where you're paying 400 or 450 euros for weevil control per year and it could go into year three so you're looking at a considerable cost in fact you're looking at about a third of the total reforestation cost could be down to pine weevil okay opposed to that if you didn't do it at all and you went filling in you can look at the cost of plants and planting again it's a lot of money even if you're filling in 50 percent of the trees you'd probably be looking at a cost of, I don't know, you'd be looking at probably 600 euros altogether between plants and planting. Uh, aside from that, if you're doing pine weevil control, it might be costing you four, four fifty. okay? So there are, and even if you did replant, you would probably still have to spray afterwards, okay? So it is important that the spraying's done if it is necessary, okay? Uh, if for successful and it's, it's a time scale thing as well tracks itself i mentioned about building awareness and the uh, knowledge dissemination uh, these are some of the methods that we use so you know we do advisory we do research events we do conferences like these uh, in addition to publications social media etc uh, what's very clear is the collective knowledge needs to be increased and that's through research collaboration, stakeholder engagement, and events like these. Uh, previously tried and tested methods of control, they may not be the best fit into the future. Okay? There's definitely challenges involved in using uh, different chemicals. However, integrated pest management and having a suite of strategies that you can use is the future. To summarize, our forest resort, resource sorry, is, is vulnerable because of its age distribution and its composition. Okay? There's going to be ever-increasing amounts of private forestry being harvested in the coming years. The overall knowledge base, I would have to say, is low among private forest owners. And that is going to be the responsibility of us as the professionals to be advising them. While the cost of weevil control is high, the potential cost uh, of tree failure and replanting is going to be higher. Okay? Uh, I'm a firm believer of only spending money once. If you have to spend it at all, spend it once. Lastly, building awareness, time-critical responses, and developing a range of control strategies are essential to mitigating the risk. Okay? Okay, John, thanks very much for that. I think um, uh, you've highlighted the need for a lot of knowledge um, building and awareness raising amongst forest owners, as well, obviously, as the industry itself. And I suppose an understanding of the challenges as well. It's important that it, that message gets out to forest owners. Um, just before I open it to people here, can I just ask, and maybe being a little bit of a devil's advocate here, um, why not in the reforestation just go for less uh, susceptible species, um, for example, just plant broadleaves? Well, what I would say is that, going back to the reliable volume, we need softwood timber uh, for saw milling and for the timber construction. We're not, or it's certainly it wouldn't be advisable to be using broadleaf timber. You're not going to produce the volume, you're not going to produce it in a time frame that's going to be there. Are you really going to use uh, valuable oak and all beaches to use as structural timber. So it's a requirement. Yes, there's going to be a greater amount of broadleaves planted and more varied species, but at the end of the day, softwoods are still going to be the core of the harvesting and milling industry and construction sector. In relation to the case study in Waterford and the private forest owner there, was it a typical mineral soil, uh, productive mineral soil? Okay, so, so yes, it, it is, yeah, it is quite productive. Uh, and it isn't like some of the older forestry, again, higher elevation, peatlands, that kind of thing. So no, it's probably less vulnerable to pine weevil, but it's still there. Uh, and, you know, it, it was the owner had brought my attention to it. He had rang me about it. And it was because he was in this knowledge transfer group and he was aware of it. 
but he is, he is, I feel, in the minority of forest owners that are aware of this risk. Just in relation to the private sector, are there contractors out there available to carry out the work? Okay, uh, well I suppose Chagas itself provides advisory and training rather than actually doing contracting. Um, talking to my forestry colleagues that are other places, yes, it is quite difficult to, to get contractors. You know, I, I think all of you would probably agree with that now at the moment. Trying to get staff, trying to get staff that were reliable, that you can actually, you know, you can put them at a task and they will come back and have it done in the correct manner. Yes, it is a constant problem. Uh, staff are out there, but if it is, it's going to cost. You know, the, the, there's no such thing as cheap labour. I mean, if you're looking at a day rate, you're probably looking at 160, 180 euros per day. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it can be done. But there's, without doubt, there's a significant shortage of contracting staff to do work, all types of work in forestry at the moment. Okay, I think the question, um, I hope I'm paraphrasing it right here, is are foresters or maybe forestry contractors registered by the government in relation to the quality of the work and the standard of the work they carry out? Okay, so uh, there is a register of foresters. Uh, it's operated by the Department of Agriculture and Forestry in the Marine. Uh, so the, the register of foresters, professional foresters, but even the contractors themselves have to be trained in the application of insecticides and herbicides under the Sustainable Use Directive as well. So yes, they have to actually have training. So was there any pine weevil migrating into the ash section of the site where there were ash stumps? Uh, not that the owner has noticed at the moment, but he literally felled it in... Uh, the end of February, start of March, and replanted it at the end of March. He, he was very keen to actually get the trees back into the ground to, I think Louise referred to it as hot planting or green planting. Uh, so he did it very quickly. Uh, but it is something that he's going to, I've asked him to monitor over the next couple of months. And it, yes, I agree, it would be very interesting to see the, the ash stumps themselves, are they, are, are, they, are they acting as a host as well?